So thank you for coming. Um, the early stages of this talk will probably be quite old hat to most of you, but I want to make sure we're uh, all on the same page before we get to the parts that everybody's going to start disagreeing with. So um, the early design of Folio, right from the, the first days of when it started to put it together, uh, we were in St. Martin in the Caribbean, which looks like it'd be a fantastic place to do this work, except that in reality we were... <laughs> <laughs> squashed into Seb's bedroom in the hotel because there was no meeting space. So a lot of the early stuff that got crashed out was done in here. And from the very beginning, the, probably the single most significant design criterion for Folio was that it would be modular and the modules would be at the heart of it, rather than that there would be some kind of core of Folio and you could modules onto the side. Uh, that was seven years ago. That's gone really quickly. So um, this is the simplified version that I show to people who are not developers. Uh, Folio is a user at a browser, and then within the Folio box, there are a bunch of conceptually separate modules. Uh, and the idea being that you can do things like swapping them out. So if your university happens to already have a perfectly good patron registration scheme that uses LDAP, then instead of using the regular mod users, you can substitute in a plug compatible uh, mod users LDAP. So that's the, it's always been the idea. And one of the big disappointments to us has been how little that kind of flexibility is actually been used until now. So I want to run through a quick refresher on, on the basics of folio architecture, not getting into any of the DevOps sort of details, but just conceptually how it works. It's got all these components, which will walk us through. It starts with a user or a web browser, and that web browser is uh, running a single page application called Stripes. Uh, the third layer is Okapi, which is the OK API gateway, and that talks to a back end where things like databases live. And this very simple model of Folio is, is perfectly good. It's obviously simplified, but nothing about it is incorrect. It just doesn't say enough. So if you want to look a little deeper than that, uh, this single page application Stripes is made up of user interface modules. And down at the back end, we're running a bunch of back end modules. Uh, and Okapi is providing the facade to all of those by taking requests of many different kinds and routing them to the appropriate back end modules. So this too is a simple, but perfectly reasonable representation of what Folio is. And this is the version in horizontal slices, which is how we developers think about it. But users think of it in a completely different way. They think of vertical slices that constitute applications. So for many of the people at this conference, and certainly many of the users of Folio, they don't know or care that there's UI users or mod users. There's just the user's application and the inventory application and the forces application. Um, and although for the simplicity of this diagram, I've drawn it as though there's always a one-to-one -one correspondence between one UI module and its backend module. In reality, it's often more complex than that. So uh, the inventory app uh, doesn't only deal with what it does with a whole bunch of others. Uh, welcome, you guys. Luckily, you haven't missed anything you didn't already know. Uh, and then there are much bigger and more complex apps uh, like uh, ERM, Electronic Resource Management, which consists of uh, half a dozen different um, user interface apps, uh, user interface modules that you run as part of Stripes. And the, the critical thing really about the idea of Folio as a, a, a scalable ecosystem type community is that all these apps can be and are made by different groups. So uh, we at Index Data did the early work on the, the users app. Uh, ERM was largely done, I think, by knowledge integration and front side and EBSCO have created a bunch of apps. And on the whole, it works surprisingly well, I think. These things all run with some degree of harmony in these two rather different uh, shared areas, the user interface, which is built one way, and the back end, which is run in very different ways. So what kinds of things can we do because Folio is modular? Well, one thing is we can just get rid of apps that our particular library doesn't need. So if you don't do electronic resource management, you can run a much more slim down version of Folio that just doesn't have it. Uh, you can make changes to modules you already have. The, the example I gave earlier, if uh, your user register is in LDAP, 
then in principle, you can replace mod users with a plug compatible module at the back end, and the user's UI and everything else will just keep working as before, uh, not even knowing anything has changed, let alone caring. And critically, of course, you can add applications. So uh, LDP, which was uh, added to uh, the flower release uh, a couple of cycles ago, uh, it was a difficult process to get it in there for reasons that we'll touch on later. But in principle, it needn't be part of the flower release. It can just run as a folio module alongside. I'm not saying let's take it out of the flower release. And similarly with the Harvester admin, which we're building at the moment, uh, may or may not go in, we just don't know. And any number of other modules um, made by any number of other different people, uh, including people we've never heard of. And for example, what I pick up the impression from people who went to the China session this morning, that those guys are doing all sorts of things that, that we didn't necessarily know about. And I think that's fantastic. That's very much the spirit of Folio, at least as I originally saw it, that uh, we don't want or need some central point of control of what can be done with it. So this kind of very flexible modularity uh, to me is a holy grail. It's very much part of what I wanted Folio to be from the beginning. Uh, and it's difficult to attain because for very sound procedural reasons, we have this kind of modular monolith at the moment, which is the flower release. Um, and they exist because in practice, people don't just want uh, an aggregation of modules from random places, but something that's uh, stable and reliable and has been tested as a unit. Uh, and all of that is really important. But the, the unfortunate side effect of it is that uh, many folio installations find themselves running nothing but the core set of modules that made it into the flower. And also in a lot of cases, running modules that made it into the flower, they don't necessarily need just because that's how it comes out of the box. Uh, and it is hard to get new code into a flower release for all the good reasons that we talked about to do with, um, in the last session actually, that Jacob ran on um, uh, folio tech debts, the importance of having uh, some kind of shared standards across the core modules and uh, shared ideas about how to do certain things and something that's maintainable by the core folio community. But equally, it's the case that we very much want to enable developments of modules outside that context that are subject to different kinds of controls that we're not in a position to dictate or maybe even understand. So that's the flourishing ecosystem that I also want to see, as well as the carefully controlled and validated core of what Folio is. So here's an aspirational scenario, something I would like to be able to do one day. Um, small library somewhere running Folio, one of the users browsing the app store sees that, for example, um, Duke University has released a, a room booking application. And they think this would be really useful for me. So on the app store, they hit a button saying, I want this. The Folio system administrator is notified. And he then is able to go off and make whatever checks he wants, have a look at the module, make sure it's up to scratch, and then install it and enable it again from within the app store and have it become available to the user. Now, at the moment, it feels like that is a long way away. And obviously, there are um, sort of procedural issues as well as technical ones. But this is the kind of thing I would love to be able to support. So how are we going to get there? Well, we need to solve all these problems, which I'm going to go through one by one and look at how we can address them. Um, so. There's a group of us that have been looking at this for the last couple of months. We've been calling ourselves uh, the Firefly team uh, because every project needs to have a logo. So we just stole the folio B and, and gave it a little <laughs> <laughs> um, And that's so it's largely index data people. There's myself uh, and Jason Skomorowski, who are developers, uh, Wayne Schneider, who is on the ops side of things, and David Crossley, uh, also involved in that. Uh, and along with that, I don't know whether Zach and Mihail will be surprised to hear uh, we consider them part of this team, but work that they've been doing is very much aligned with this kind of goal. Um, so here are some of the directions that we're going. A lot of this is very much aligned with what's happening elsewhere in the Folio community. Some of it is new, and I want to be clear that we're not just kind of coming along and plonking us on the table and saying, this is the way to do this. It's work in progress. We're looking for feedback. We want to make sure that we find the right way to do this. 
But here's the first thing, and it's come up a lot in the last couple of days, the smaller, lighter base platform for the back end. So yes, we're going to talk about wanting to add modules later in this talk, but also we often want less folio. We might want to be able to make a little standalone folio that just does check-in and check-out, for example, or build an app that does that against a small back end. Um, and at present, the only maintained platform for folio is platform complete. Uh, and that at the moment has 140 back end and edge modules, uh, 29 user interface apps and a bunch of plugins and some other bits and pieces. Um, so if you download, uh, if you're a developer and you download a virtual machine to run folio in, you're, you're running all the stuff, which in practice means I can't do development on my laptop anymore, like I used to when Folio was smaller. Um, so everybody wants platform minimal for a whole bunch of different reasons. Um, there's a channel on Folio Slack called Platform Minimal, which anybody who's interested in this is welcome to join. And there's a bunch of uh, specific pieces of work that, that are being done towards enabling us to run a smaller platform. Uh, one of those is that uh, for historical reasons, mod users BL, which is used to do the enhanced login when you first log into Folio, has hard dependencies on loads of things, um, which ought to be made optional. Uh, we, there are people, I'm pleased to say, who are working on that already. And then related to this, when you log into Folio, uh, the, the way Stripes is written, it knows about the very inventory specific concept of a, of a service point which means that merely to be able to log in, you have to have all of inventory and all the baggage that comes along with that. So disentangling these things is it's one of the eight prongs of what we would like to do. To make it possible, ultimately, we hope to run a folio that has you know, maybe three or four modules total, do things like um, authentication. So just enough that you can log onto it and there's nothing else you can do. And from that little platform, you might use it as a base for developing new modules with a very small footprint, or you might use it as a base if you're a small library for installing the modules you actually want and actually running Folio from that. There may be other things we can do with that. So um, there are solutions or candidate solutions to these problems. The service point issue, I think Mihail Kuklis is working on, and possibly we just need to slightly up the heat on him. He'll just fix it one weekend. <laughs> Here's a second thing sort of related to that. There are some, or have been some unexamined assumptions that got built into the code early on, um, just for convenience. So when you build the Stripes bundle out of node packages, historically the way the bundler would decide whether or not a package is a, a folio module was whether it was in the folio namespace. Now that's obviously wrong. Um, you can have things, just in the folio namespace that are not stripes modules and don't need all the special care and that they need and things that are in other namespaces that do so for example the reshare packages and reshare is built on the folio <coughs> platform are in the reshare namespace but just like any other stripes module uh, when they're being built they need to be analyzed for whether they carry translations uh, whether they need uh, transpiling and a bunch of other things that are specific to how you build a stripes module now uh, that is fixed but unmerged uh, and again we have Mikhail to thank for doing this work uh, it's not been merged because morning glory uh, is about to be released and this isn't really the moment to make uh, a change with even the slightest potential to send things wrong. But at the moment that's released, this gets merged, that problem goes away. And it's possible that there are other similar kinds of assumptions somewhere, like um, perhaps we've got some code somewhere that assumes the source code of every module is going to be in the uh, Folio org GitHub. Um, and as we come across those, we just need to find the ways to take away those assumptions. So modules can be built by anyone, anywhere. Let's assume for the moment that we've solved all the problems of modules that uh, anybody's module can run. Then the next thing we want to think about is applications, uh, just like users do. So there are UI modules, there are backend modules. At the moment in Folio, there's no formalized notion of an application consisting of a set of one or more user interface modules and a set of, well, I could say zero or more, and a set of zero or more backend modules. So that work together. So 
Um, we are prototyping a format for expressing this. Now, this work is not done. And as I present the next few slides, all of you will immediately think, ah, oh, but what about? And you'll be right to think that. I hope we'll have discussion time at the end. But this is how it looks at the moment. So we call it the FAM file, which stands for Folio Application Metadata. And it's a JSON-based format. Uh, and here is an example of one. This is describing the application called Harvester Admin, which is a, a folio application for administrating uh, a harvesting backend. Uh, and this is a machine readable field, the name of the application and the version of the application. Then there are a couple of human readable fields that go along with those. Display name and description, which are just what they look like. And the idea is that these will be visible in the App Store. Uh, and then we get onto the meat of what this is, the kind of manifest of what the elements are that make up the application. So elements is an array of objects. Each object contains a type, which can be UI or backend, uh, and an indication of whether this is required as part of the app or whether it's an optional part. Uh, then a pointer to the module descriptor, which needs to be inserted into Okapi so it knows about the module and how to proxy it. And critically, of course, the URL to the actual object that you're going to be running. So for a UI module, that's a, a, an NPM package. Um, and then similarly for backend modules, uh, type is backend. Uh, you've got your required Boolean and the descriptor is the same. In this case, the URL is, points to a Docker container. And if you're of a pedantic turn of mind, you'll want to point out that that's not actually a URL, but it's kind of like one. So this is the manifest. Now, suppose I give you a fan file and say, here, install this, and you do that. And uh, it ends up that what I've given you is full of malware and your system crashes and all your users sue you. You won't be as delighted with me as you might otherwise be. So one of the really important parts of this is a way of certifying apps. We need to know who published each one, who's taking responsibility for it. But we also want to be able to make a lot of other claims about an app, such as we might want Philip Jacobson to sign off and say, yes, I did the user experience design for this and I'm happy with it. Or for somebody else to say, I've checked the code, all the text is internationalized, so you can make a German translation of it. Uh, and there are other claims you might want to make. So here's how we propose to address this. This is the same fan file we were looking at before, except I've collapsed the elements uh, array that we don't need anymore. Here is a certification. So certified is an array. Each object has a type. The most important type is published. And this is an assertion that the module was published by a particular organization and that that organization stands behind it and is prepared to warrant that it isn't going to destroy your system. And the certifier is indicated by a domain name of the organization responsible, in this case, indexdata.com. And the proof of this is given as a signature, which is encrypted using the organization's private key and be verified using its public key. And what exactly is signed? Well, it's a digest of the fan file made by basically rendering it in a canonicalized, minified form and then taking the uh, MD5 sum or similar of the result. Uh, that isn't quite true for a reason I'll come to in a moment. Here's a second certification. Uh, this one is from uh, Samhain.com. Mm. It's a Danish name, so it's probably pronounced something like Sphere. <laughs> um, and this is a claim that the user experience has, has been designed and that's signed. Now, when you sign something like a user experience claim, what you're making the claim about is the app and its elements and its publisher. But when you add another certification to this, you don't want to be bothered about certifying that yes, you agree about the UX. We want it to be that different organizations can contribute certifications without needing to take into account the certifications that are already there. So in calculating the digest of the FAM file, we want to omit all the certifications except published. Okay, oh yeah, sorry, go ahead. Um, do you want, well, a question to come up in chat. I was wondering if you'd like questions as you go or wait till the end. Uh, how are we doing for time? I don't have a watch. 10 minutes to go. 10 till noon. When do we start? <laughs> Half past. 
Uh, let's have a couple of questions and I'll, I'll rudely cut you off when I feel we're running out of time. Okay. Um, does anyone have the chat open? Because Maccabee had something in the, in the Zoom chat. I think, I think his question was about response. You said the responsibility of the application. Yeah. His question was along the lines of does that mean that organization is responsible for the constituent modules within the application? Yeah. I mean, that, these you kinds have, of. You have the chat. So, oh, there we go. Yeah, and that's an important broader point, the distinction between the app and the things that make it up. So we will need to think through this in, in some detail, but I feel like this is a certification of the app, which means that we're saying, say it's made up of index data publishes an app, and it's made up of a UI module created by knowledge integration and backend module created by EBSCO. One of the things we're saying when we publish that app is, We've looked at these front end and back end. We're happy that they work together. Uh, we're, we're, so we're publishing the app that's based on this. Obviously, in doing that, we're not claiming any ownership of the constituent parts. But I do think we're claiming responsibility, which makes it sound like a terrorist outrage. Should, shouldn't there be a hierarchy here that basically, if you if you certify the parts separately, don't you have a parent certification of the whole of the app itself? Um, so that's why the certifications are of the app as a whole. I'm trying to understand what UX type of certification means. Is that certifying the UI modules versus the backend modules? No, I mean, I don't want to get too much into individual types of certification, and that's something to be thrashed out. But we imagine a, a, a smallish controlled vocabulary of short strings whose exact meanings will get worked out so we can make the assertions we want to. But they will be assertions about the app as a whole. Okay. I, I guess my broader question was, if we have an array for the certifications, mm -hmm. how do I know looking at it that I am satisfied that it has covered all the possible types that I need and what, what's my overall assessment that says who right. to use? So this is a judgment for you to make and different organizations have different criteria. So a little library in the Midwest might not care about internationalization, for example. Uh, that was probably very patronizing to anyone from the Midwest. <laughs> <laughs> oh, hang on, hang on. A library in England definitely won't care about international. <laughs> 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 yeah. Well, England's not really big enough to have a Midwest. <laughs> uh, yeah, I'll take one more and then I want to push on. Will you be discussing um, dependencies? like these kind of knock-on dependencies between the Yeah, so do you remember early on I said, you're all gonna think of objections that we want to discuss at the end. That's the big one. Perfect, yeah. All right, let's suppose for a moment that the FAM file format is completely perfect. Uh, and we know there's a lot of work to be done on it, but you know, the day will come, of course, when it is perfected. Um, where are you gonna put applications that you want to make available to the world? Well, I can skip quickly over this because the answer really is, uh, it's up to you. And, and this again is to do with wanting to say to any given organization or even individual that you, in order to make something that can run in Folio, you don't need to be part of the Folio organization. You don't need to use uh, Folio repositories for your artifacts. So there are four different kinds of things that you might need to publish the FAM file, uh, the module descriptors for both UI and backend modules. NPM packages for UI modules and Docker containers for the backend modules. But for all of these, um, you, you can, broadly speaking, you can do what you want. So we have a, a convention that you put fan files in a, a GitHub repository in a, in a directory called apps at the top level. Uh, and the reason for that will become apparent a little later. Um, module descriptors, well, again, you can put them anywhere. There's the, the existing folio registry of module descriptors, which I think contains something like 50,000 descriptors now because it's every published version of every module and it's never been cleaned out. It actually has. It has. It, it's like 8,000 now. I'm sorry, it's, it's been cleaned up. There was a facility where we actually removed quite a few. Okay. Yeah. There's only 8,000. <laughs> and then there's an index data repository which we stood up recently and that contains something like six module descriptors but the, you know the idea here isn't we're going to make an index data one that's different from folios one it's that anybody can put these things up anywhere and uh, i don't doubt for example that there'll be a chinese one 
And similarly, your NPM packages can go in the Folio NPM registry if, if they're accepted there, or the Global NPM registry, or, or any other one that anybody wants to stand up. And your Docker containers can go in Docker Hub. They can go in Folio's Docker Hub Mirror. Um, we're at the moment using GitHub packages, so a facility provided by GitHub itself for publishing artifacts. Uh, but again, it doesn't matter where. Um, and the important point I want to emphasize again is, is that we're not at all wanting to dictate or even suggest where you want to put things. Uh, it's up to your organization to make the choices that make sense for you. So we've made our choices. Um, what we want is to avoid a monolith. So uh, we don't want it to be so that you have to do things the folio core way using the folio monolith where you have to use the folio uh, GitHub space for your source code and where you have to publish the folio uh, NPM repository and all the rest of it. Those things are great for core modules, but not everything's going to be a core module. And if we want an ecosystem that's populated by many actors, then these are among the uh, assumptions that we need to help people just to sidestep. By the way, um, one possible um, benefit of going down these kinds of paths is that the flower releases might get smaller. I don't think it's impossible that we might look at what, everything that's in Morning Glory and say, actually, these modules are the ones we call the core. The others can be made available for people to add to their failure installations, but maybe don't need to be subject to the same degree of laborious analysis and testing and um, all the other stuff that goes into making a flower release. That's possible. OK, suppose you've published your fan files in a GitHub repository with an apps directory and Zach has published his in another such directory, and there's a whole bunch of those. How do you discover them? Well, uh, again, the prototype kind of candidate answer is Mod App Manager, which is a pretty simple module um, which stores in its configuration details of a whole bunch of these GitHub repositories where apps live. Um, and then the only thing it really does, apart from allowing you to crud that list of registries, is return the set of all the fan files it knows about that are in there. So uh, here's how it looks when you're maintaining your repositories. This is like so many good things on a branch of UI developer. Uh, and you're immediately thinking, but Mike, you're leaking GitHub tokens to the world. Um, and I just, it's not an important point this, but I want to just reassure people so you don't run off down a path. Um, this isn't a problem because all they're doing is allowing read-only access via the GitHub web service to repositories that are already globally visible for anybody to read. The only reason we need the token is to avoid GitHub's rate limiting. So that potentially gives us the beginning of an app store. We have a way of generating a list of all the apps that are known uh, in all the places that we know of them. What would we do with an app store? It's all very well to just kind of airily think of what an app store looks like. Who would use it? Well, here are a bunch of possible ways that the App Store UI could be used once it gets built. Uh, platform administrators, so we're talking about people running a whole folio installation, are then in a position to add and deploy apps from the App Store. So that'll be a decision that's not taken lightly, although the certification should certainly help. And when I was talking about my scenario earlier of somebody installing Duke University's new uh, room booking module, uh, one of the first things they would do is look at the certifications and say, yes, Duke actually made this. These people have said that it's up to scratch in different ways. So that's part of the information that an app store would display, which certifications uh, are in place, and that would aid people in making those kinds of decisions. How would a platform administrator add and deploy such an app? We'll come to that in a minute. What else could happen? Well, tenants administrators, remembering that a typical folio installation runs multiple tenants, Tenants administrators will be different people. They will then be able to enable and disable the apps that are in place, potentially using the same user interface. Uh, we have a bad user interface for that already, which I'll show you in a minute. What about regular users? Well, it doesn't seem unreasonable that they might browse the app store and see what's out there and use that to make requests of people higher up the hierarchy and say, I wish we could have this app like the guy in the little library that I proposed earlier who sees the, the room booking app is coming to existence. And then obviously they wouldn't have the ability to do the install, but just to raise it to the attention of people who can. So 
I said we would move on to the question of how you actually install one of these apps, given a fan file. We have uh, a script called Folio Couple. Uh, that's my English pronunciation. I think most people prefer Folio Control. So I'll try and say that, but if I say Cuddle, that's what I mean. Uh, and just like Apache Control and uh, Q Control and a whole bunch of other such scripts, uh, its first argument is a subcommand, or like Git for that matter, you know, Git commits. So what subcommands does Folio Control understand? Uh, it's vast array of, of one subcommand uh, as things stand at the moment, uh, which is add app. And you run that, giving it the name of a fan file, which you may have discovered using Mod App Manager and downloaded. It reads the fan file uh, and it inserts all the module descriptors of all the elements into the Okapi that's specified by environment variables. And it deploys the backend modules. How does it do that? You'll ask yourself. Uh, I'll tell you after. I just need to quickly make a point that what it doesn't do yet is uh, rebuild the front end bundles. So the newly available apps with the script in the state it is now won't actually make them available to users. Uh, in another week or so, it will, because I spent much of the last week uh, talking to Wayne about how we build apps uh, and strike bundles, and I, I know how to make do that now. Now, every folio operator handles deployment differently from every other one, right? There's some degree of commonality. I think there are plenty of people who use uh, Flux to control Kubernetes. There are people who use Docker Swarm and so forth. So <clears throat> to allow for that, Folio Control app uses a, a, a simple plugin interface to do deployments. Um, and allows you to provide many different plugins that will do deployment by different means. And when I say many different, obviously I mean so far exactly one. Uh, and that's the one that does deployment by Okapi's built-in deployment mechanism. So that really is proof of concept. Uh, and using that, I have proof of concept, it does work. But in real life, we're gonna be using other things. Um, and it happens that index data's deployments are mostly done using Flux over Kubernetes. So that'll be the next uh, plugin that I run. But that wasn't possible. So whatever you use for deployments, you can set it up to be able to do this. And then uh, what else will we want to do with Folio Control? Well, we're gonna want um, subcommands that do things like removing an app as an obvious one, uh, possibly enabling and disabling for tenants, although that's pretty simple anyway, it's a single Okapi control. Uh, rebuilding strikes bundles is gonna be an important one. And then whatever else comes along later. So that's Folio control. Um, lots of different scenarios where this could be useful. In the kind of dream one, we actually use it for provisioning real modules in a running Folio system, but maybe in the short term, it's likely to be more useful for quickly getting uh, iterated versions of uh, development code in front of users. Uh, something Ian Ibbotson talked about yesterday, that developing Folio modules is one thing, but going through the whole process of getting them into a system in a way that users can look at them and give you feedback, that's much more laborious. But uh, we hope we can make that one come on. So that's folio control. What we really want is mod folio control, which we've not yet started work on. So essentially, it'll be a web service way of invoking all the same stuff that folio control does. Uh, and at that point, we're going to be in a position to build a user interface, uh, probably somewhere in developer settings or maybe its own application, uh, that will let you make these kinds of changes to your running folio. So, um, Remember, whenever you're running Folio, you're always running as a tenant. So some of the things that you're going to want to do in this console, you will do in the context of a particular tenant, like enabling and disabling modules. Others you want to do as a super tenant. So that were necessary to build a Stripes bundle that lets you log in as a super tenant to do these very high level things. Uh, so here's the Okapi console as it exists today. Uh, it's in developer settings. It's actually on snapshots. You can have a bit of a look at it if you want. Um, and I'm not going to run through it in detail, but the configuration and environment tabs are pretty straightforward. There's not too much going on there. All the real fun is here on the modules tab. So you can see what modules Folio knows about. You can narrow that down by these four categories. At the moment, we're restricting to the latest because 
for typically our own copy also knows about many, many older versions that are not really of interest. And if you click on an individual one of these module names, it'll give you a lot more information like which interfaces it provides, which it requires, uh, and crucially, uh, which nodes it's deployed on and what URL. Uh, and if you have the appropriate high-level permissions, you can use it to stop an existing deployment, uh, but not yet to start a new one. So again, like so much of this, very much work in progress, very much subject to feedback. So these are the eight kind of areas that we're trying to push towards in uh, Project Firefly, which we hope will get us to the point where that scenario I began with uh, can be a reality. I, I want to just be a little bit uh, evangelistic, really, to finish with before we get to the discussion and talk about why this matters. And it really does come down to the genesis of Folio, not just as a monolithic ILS, but as a project that anyone in the world can contribute to in lots of different ways. Uh, and by the way, that doesn't just mean developers uh, making apps. Also means, for example, uh, you could contribute to Folio by doing certifications. You could be the person who checks a, an existing app for um, accessibility or whatever it might be and providing a certification for it. So there's a lot that can be done here. Certifications are also important for this reason. We want the barrier of entry participating in one sense to be extremely low but not in a way that just floods the market with hundreds of very low quality student project folio modules. So I, I hope that the approach we're taking here means that anyone can make a folio module, but nobody else is obliged to pay any attention to it. And I think the certifications are a big part of that. And probably if we go down a path like this, one of the things that is going to be configured in any given folio installation is a list of who are the module suppliers that we trust. Who are the people who's, uh, when they publish an app, we're prepared to take a good look at that and possibly not look at others at all. And the goal, or the hope, is that what comes out of this is an ecosystem to an extent that we don't yet have with Folio. So I know of a few people I've spoken to in the last couple of days who've done their own work on Folio modules just in their institutions, but not made it available elsewhere for various perfectly good logistic reasons. Um, and I hope we can take those logistic reasons away so that anybody who's made something good can give it to the community or indeed sell it to the community. It's nothing that says uh, every app has to be free. Um, and the other part of this is we want Folio to be something that can grow far beyond the initial community of a handful of companies that, that built the early software and of the early adopter libraries. And we want it to be that whatever happens to those initially core organizations, uh, the system itself has enough flexibility and momentum that it can carry on just as well without us. So that's essentially everything I wanted to present. If you'd like to read more um, about the, um, the vision, I suppose, rather than the details, uh, this recent article in the International Journal of Librarianship is open access. You're very welcome to find that at tinyurl.com slash folio mod. Uh, that doesn't go into any of the technical details. If you want to find the technical details, I guess the best thing would be uh, just drop me a line on Slack and I can add you to a, a channel where we can discuss these kinds of things in more detail. And with that, uh, I'd like to use the remaining time to discuss the uh, many open issues.